Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today and a very warm welcome to the third episode of Studio SML Sessions, Brave New World. This event is presented by the Press Room and supported by the Design Singapore Council and the National Design Center. I am Felicia from the Design Singapore Council and I will be your MC for today. Today's Studio SML session, Brave New World, will ponder the importance of our roots. To make creative breakthroughs and find new frontiers, we sometimes have to go back to the beginning. But what does this mean for design? You'll hear more from our panel of speakers through a presentation of their works and perspectives in the first half of the session before we move into a panel discussion and Q&A segment in the later half. So first of all, we have uh, Hani Chung, Creative Director of Produce, a multiple award-winning design studio with prototyping capabilities. Produce was set up to deliver highly robust and bespoke design solutions from concept to construction. And joining us today is also Jonathan Yuan, founder of Roots, an independent branding and creative design studio with a keen focus on cultures, ideas, and craft. Roots has developed award-winning, meaningful design stories for many notable brands, businesses, and institutions. And last but definitely not the least, we have Woon Wong, director of Viewport Studio, joining us from the UK. Viewport Studio is an architecture and design studio that is based in both London and Singapore. They have designed a series of award-winning spaces and products that combines innovation with a rigorous attention to detail. Moderating our session for today is Kelly Cheng, founder of Studio SML and the founder and creative director of The Press Room, a publishing and design consultancy. So without further ado, I'll hand the time over now to Kelly to officially kickstart today's session. Kelly, over to you, please. Thank you. Felicia. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at uh, this talk today. Um, and you won't be disappointed because uh, we have three really good designers today. Um, and I'm a big fan of all their works as well. So I think we are all going to be very inspired. Um, without much further ado, uh, I would want to do a short intro of uh, Yi Chen, uh, just to add on to Felicia. Uh, Pan Yi Chen is a strong advocate for parametric architecture, still not so common in Singapore, but uh, Yi Chen has devoted much of his practice in pursuit of re redefining what craftsmanship means in this digital era through, uh, through his parametric architecture. So uh, here, I'm going to hand over to Pan Yi Chen. Hi, thank you very much for the introduction. I'll just share my screen now. I, I actually run uh, three companies. So I have Type Zero Architecture, Produce, and Superstructure. So these three companies has uh, slightly different focuses as well as expertise, um, but um, they are put together uh, over a course of eight years. Um, um, you know, I, I was in practice uh, since 2013. And um, the, the primary motivation behind uh, this assembly was actually making. So right at the beginning, I wanted to um, make design and make. So um, having uh, a really nice workshop to uh, experiment in was something that I wanted to do for my studio um, to model after a school environment where we could simply just go downstairs and um, test out our ideas in the workshop. So in 2013, uh, Produce occupied a half um, a workshop area and with our design studio on the second floor, um, we got hold of a CNC machine and um, uh, a laser cutter. And there uh, began our journey for uh, design and make. Um, gradually, uh, we managed to grow. And in 2017, uh, we decided to uh, make the workshop a separate entity. And I collaborated uh, and partnered up with Emily from um, Panelock to start Superstructure. And Superstructure uh, concentrates on doing digital fabrication and uh, unique installations. Um, we are into, uh, I think, the third year of, uh, of our operations. And we are getting hold of uh, a 3D printer a large one, as well as uh, looking forward to have our first robot uh, this year. So the type of projects uh, we do collectively between these three companies range from furniture to uh, in the middle is a music theater uh, a private, uh, for a private home, as well as experimental structures. And right now we are actually also working on mass engineered timber buildings. So um, I've titled my talk as Project Synthesis because um, throughout these eight years, I 
find that um, the experiences that we had uh, allow us to put together uh, not just these three uh, different companies, but um, I, I see that we can uh, accumulate, accumulate uh, knowledge to go forward into the fourth industrial revolution. So about 100 years ago, um, Le Corbusier started with this, uh, um, uh, this simple building um, and he wanted to mass produce this uh, to satisfy the growing demand for housing at a time where the frame was uh, pre-fabricated uh, and everything filling in is customized by the uh, inhabitants. So he was very much ahead of his time, um, but that heralded in an uh, entire century of um, RC frame and steel frame buildings, which very much uh, typify uh, what modernist buildings is about. And uh, to a large extent, technological uh, production became its own kind of process that um, also conversely limits uh, the architectural expression. But um, can we continue to build uh, using this uh, technique? Uh, because actually concrete is one of the most uh, destructive material uh, that we have. It contributes to um, a huge amount of carbon emission. Um, and embodied carbon uh, is cu currently 10% um, of global emission annually and rising. Um, likewise, uh, it depletes, uh, like, st uh, like concrete steel, uh, steel production depletes the earth and emits a lot of uh, carbon. And um, it also uh, is very labor intensive. And all these problems are kind of exemplified uh, and amplified during the pandemic. And uh, last but not least, it, it is not uh, recyclable. So most of them become um, placed into landfills. So we have had um, almost 100 years of excess and waste uh, in this predominant way of building. And right now, uh, the digitalization process that we have in the construction industry would allow us uh, to combine all these different strategies um, from robotics to AI uh, to data um, analytics. And to, we can combine all these strategies to uh, create a new digital uh, platform and also method that would herald in the next uh, you know, uh, development of architecture in the future. So I see this as a possibility for the architect to uh, once again control the entire means of production of architecture and to kind of influence the, this production. Uh, we are at this stage where we no longer is subservient to the building technology that is out there already. We can, at this moment, design new uh, machines um, specific to the um, system of building that we want to create. So this computation, computational workflow um, says, uh, is important for this entire transformation. And it's a case where we need to um, jump back and forth and do multiple iter iterations. And uh, digitalization uh, and computation allow us to do that. Um, we have actually, uh, despite the, having these three separate companies, uh, we have a department that spans across these three companies, and this is the computational team. It is also a department where we um, accumulate our knowledge and uh, to look forward to new building systems. So I'll just show uh, a number of projects that we have done over the course of eight years. Um, primarily, the first set of uh, experiments was to look at how flat materials can become um, you know, an organic surface uh, or doubly curved surface. So the first project was um, Herman Miller at Extra, shop in shop at Park Mall. And here we combined the, um, you know, used uh, inspiration from Eames furniture where it's, it is uh, made primarily of uh, molded plywood. And we look at an, uh, a geometry and a building technique that would be able to put together flat pieces of plywood without steam bending or molding. Uh, created a, a triangle, uh, triangulated um, um, grid system where the panels are simply hooked uh, to each other. And this uh, is combined with uh, other components that would then form the entire system. Um, so this is almost like redesigning a brick, although this brick has to be put together uh, in sequence 
and uh, each brick has a specific position within the entire uh, geometry. Um, the entire structure is built of 4,000 over pieces of plywood uh, modules. Uh, each piece is about three millimeters thick and uh, it forms a rigid grid shell that became a skin for a Herman Miller shop within Extra. So uh, we learned a lot from this project. Uh, and at that time, we did not have our CNC machine. But soon after this project, we realized very quickly that in order to have uh, experimentations of our own, uh, we needed a machine uh, um, to be able to have this rapid uh, iteration of uh, options. So the second uh, shop in shop um, was uh, also by Extra. And uh, they had to move out of Park Mall and uh, into Marina Square. So here we wanted to reduce the number of parts. And by doing that, we looked at how we can maximize uh, the basic uh, size of plywood, which is four by eight feet. And uh, we exported uh, tailoring onto plywood. So this is an initial test of cutting darts into the plywood and then stitching it back up to allow the plywood to be bent uh, without uh, naturally and, and without any uh, steam bending process. Um, we had to digitalize this, digitalize it in order to build it at a larger scale. So here we are using a physics engine to simulate uh, the, the elasticity, uh, the bending of the plywood. Um, and we had to do multiple uh, iteration. And this is where the digital fabrication process and prototyping comes in very handy because then from these experiments, we created the DNA or rather the um, kind of relationship between the, the dart angle and the surface deformation uh, angle. Uh, and this became a parameter for the overall system. So we had a proof of concept with a one-to-one -one mockup. And then uh, looking at how we can best uh, exemplify this new system, uh, we look at creating the minimal surface, just like how Frey Otto uh, described the minimal surface with a soap film uh, bubble. Uh, we tested it at, as, uh, uh, with, with this uh, technique onto uh, just simple wires. And once again, we had to use uh, a physics engine uh, to simulate the uh, minimal surface uh, onto the frame. That became uh, the 400 components that we have. And uh, this time around, the plywood was made of two millimeters thick plywood. And um, the, the entire fabrication and assembly process was actually very simple. Uh, we only had fresh graduates uh, from all different disciplines. Some of them are accountant trained to just basically stitch the plywood together using cable tie and they are put together using pop rivets. And the way it is uh, being assembled uh, are very much like how you would pull up a canvas. And finally, the, the outcome, um, I find that it is very fit uh, for its technique. Uh, These holes that you see here are meant to relax the, the surface at the specific points so that they do not crack. And it became a kind of signature um, expression of this entire system. Um, and, and basically, uh, everyone could you know, form their own uh, experience and impression of this uh, structure. Some of them think of it as caves, and some of them um, think of it like a bazaar uh, with this uh, very casual fabric uh, pulled over. But um, I, I think the main uh, important point is that they learn a lot more about uh, Herman Miller and the early Eames furniture through this process of experimentation. Um, furthermore, um, we tried the same um, to look at how flat materials can become organic surface using um, another format, which is to look at a uh, ribbon. And here it's a collaboration with uh, Formica and we use uh, the laminate, uh, Formica laminate to reinforce plywood. Um, again, it's three millimeters thick, but uh, because it is cut in strip, it allows for um, a torsion uh, to a certain degree. And here we created almost like a basket uh, structure um, that is um, calculated using a gravitational model. Um, and at the end of the project, uh, two weeks long exhibition, I 
uh, load tested it myself. And um, uh, it is interesting that the, to build this 10 meters wide structure and five meters tall uh, structure, we only utilize one pallet of material when we finally demolished it. So this shows uh, processes can drastically reduce the amount of material we use uh, as we design. Um, so the next set of uh, experimentation is to look at how we can reduce complex surfaces into simple panels, flat panels, so that it's easier for fabrication. And so here we look at masonry uh, vaults and um, vault structure. And this iteration, uh, this was for an office. And uh, the structure is like a, a scroll that is going through the office, creating um, different uh, uh, spaces for different uh, departments within the office. So it becomes an office that's open plan, yet uh, there are uh, kind of uh, um, spaces for, for uh, different cells within, within this office. Um, as a triangulated uh, panel structure, we wanted to use uh, something that is developed finger joint. Uh, in this case, they are compressed together using bolt and nut. Um, so uh, and they align the, the different panels together. So it's actually very easy to put together. And uh, the entire process was cut using our 5-axis CNC machine. And, and then they are pre-assembled pre in strips. And um, the assembly process simply is to put the strips together uh, by bolting. Um, so because the edges are all calculated specific to how the overall uh, to topology will perform, um, they simply uh, fall into shape to form the arch. And uh, the other good thing is that we can pre-plan a lot of uh, services. Uh, in here on the right, you see lights being uh, already uh, planned within the structure. And we also uh, uh, do uh, um, kind of dovetail the sprinkler insulation as we produce uh, the panels. Finally, um, it is a structure that is uh, sound absorbent. We clad the underneath with acoustic felt and the uh, other side with raw length. It is almost paper thin. It's overall 40 millimeters thick and, and uh, uh, kind of more than 50 meters long. And, and following that, we started to look at hexagonal grid, grid uh, system to form a vault. And this was for a uh, uh, entertainment space within a private home. Uh, right now, we are into the third or fourth iterations uh, of this system. And uh, we are able to uh, kind of already supply them as a uh, building system and product for any space. So given the, the, the space, we can easily recreate a grid shell, um, a vault using uh, our script, and they will break them down into its component parts, which we will then um, also have the um, milling uh, information uh, already input and ready for production. So likewise, we always um, do the dry installation uh, and this is used to um, communicate to the installers uh, and the, the, the builder how this whole system works. So this beats any drawings, you know, um, and they communicate best in terms of um, translating uh, drawing uh, to form. Uh, that is a, a demonstration. So here we have all the cells uh, um, before they are finished. Uh, so they are filled with rock wool. And then uh, doing the uh, rendering we have and the final build. So uh, with the digital process, we are already um, looking at a digital twin uh, before anything goes on site. Um, going up the scale uh, in this uh, panelization idea, we, we receive a a call from a, a, you know, a music hall project in the Middle East, and they are using um, um, acoustic panel fabricator from Ireland, engaged by this Irish company um, to calculate and break the, uh, this organic surface into component parts. So here we uh, 
used uh, um, our geometrical uh, analysis um, to then look at what is the most efficient way to lay them out so, so that we have minimum milling. So these circles that you see here are the uh, minimum milling that we need to do to, to make the curved surface. And we even calculated how the veneer will be laid onto this uh, doubly curved surfaces. And finally, uh, this is uh, the process during installation. And um, we, we start to see that our products are no longer uh, a physical installation, but more and more it is a digital file that can be um, exported to any part of the world. And if they share the same machine um, that we have, we, we actually then speak the same language in terms of fabrication. Uh, one of our main um, uh, ambition here is to drive the whole uh, transformation into mass engineered timber buildings. And so in 2019, we started experimenting with reconstituted timber uh, with a company called One Wood. And here uh, we started looking at uh, prefabricated standard panels that can then replace RC concrete panels. Um, so on the left, there's a one way slab, and on the right, it is a two way slab. Um, we wanted to reduce the amount of material used here, and at the same time, using fast growing uh, plantation timber that we can find in the region. Um, we can then uh, further our research to look at uh, mass customized bespoke uh, structures where the column positions can, can freely uh, be moved during the design process and the waffles will reorganize accordingly. So in 2019, we did this uh, simple uh, experiment at Art Expo at Marina Bay Sands. And uh, we uh, recently just completed our proof of concept with uh, Design Singapore Good Re uh, Design Research Grant. And uh, right now we are looking forward to uh, further this experimentation. fibers of timber that can be either recycled or from very, very fast growing plantation timber. Um, the harvest time is uh, less than seven years and um, they can then be pressed together with all these cavities to reduce weight, but also to um, put in services like lighting um, and water pipes. So we are currently conducting a series of tests to look at how uh, it performs structurally and then we will uh, in time get the certification uh, that is compatible, compatible with the EU code. So um, just to conclude, I think uh, with the fourth industrial revolution, we have a few change in terms of how um, a mindset change we need to concept of construction, uh, changing to um, fabrication. In, in which uh, things are built off-site within controlled environment where waste is drast drastically reduced and pollution drastically reduced. It is more efficient and safe. And then we need to start looking at building as a product where all its component parts are fitted together just like in the automobile industry. Uh, this is important to um, uh, create a better efficiency and productivity in the, in the entire building industry. And finally, we need to propose as much as possible these new technologies whenever there's an opportunity. So uh, throughout uh, these few years, we have been proposing, um, for example, concrete uh, printing technologies together with uh, MET structures in some of our competitions. And finally, uh, um, hopefully by then we can uh, kind of really ask this question, like how Louis Ka Louis Kahn uh, asked the brick, uh, what does the brick want to be? In this case, well, what will the building system uh, become? And what is the greatest potential that we can yield from a new building system created? Thank you very much. Thank you, Yicheng. Let us now welcome Jonathan Yuan, founder of Roots, to join us on screen, please. Hello, hi, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for your time. Um, I'm Jonathan, so I'm a graphic designer and I run an independent design studio called Roots, uh, specializing in creative directions, branding, and graphic design. 
So basically what I do or what we do is that uh, we consult and help uh, businesses, brands to kind of like uh, strategize and have uh, creative directions for their businesses, for their brands, for their communications. And then we work out a branding system expressions to kind of like uh, move forward the directions and then how we kind of like um, work out all these things is through the craft of graphic design. So basically that is kind of like the, what we do in the studio. Yeah. So as a graphic designer, my role in a, in a, in a, in a short way is that I convey ideas and information. And uh, I facilitated this role primarily through designing visual language. Basically, it's um, designing visual forms and uh, visual elements to kind of express all these ideas that we conceptualize uh, for the for for the project. So I mean, um, I've been in this industry for like a decade plus. So doing all these uh, visual language designing is actually what I enjoy most doing. Yeah, so. This is just a kind of like a overview of uh, the past works that we have done over a decade. Um, you can see that uh, we work with clients big and small. Uh, from the biggest, we have like um, doing the SG Bicentennial with the Prime Minister office to smaller projects like book designs, work with individual artists, et cetera. So for each of these projects, we try very hard to kind of have like a designing a uh, distinct visual language for the project itself. And um, how do we do is that I create abstract idea and then express it in visual forms using uh, shapes, symbols, colors, images, letter forms, and typography. So all these, when kind of like, when you put it together, it kind of constitute the visual language of the design. Lab. So like idea that we, it, it, like an idea that all these visual language try, uh, trying to express, I feel that good visual language has to be relevant and meaningful. So for this talk, um, I just kind of like, like to share a few projects that I feel um, um, it, it kind of like, uh, just to take on the themes of the talk sessions is that uh, kind of like looking back the past, of the heritage or even some sort of like a like a histories of all these uh, brands and, and 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 projects and then how it kind of like help us to 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 conceptualize and develop a distinct visual language for this project yeah so one of the first project that I, I would like to share is uh, the SG bicentennial project um, it's two years two to three years ago uh, that run nations why um so this is uh we, we actually is the brand agency working with jwt and under jwt consortium so they kind of invited us to be the brand agency to work with them on this uh, campaign and um so for us is that we work directly with the prime minister office and for sg bicentennial if uh just to give you a, a bit of a background information um it's a national commemoration cam uh, campaign um, to celebrate the 700 years histories of Singapore. So Bicentennial is like 200 year history, but uh, for the campaign itself, they actually kind of planned and wanted to kind of like, uh, you know, get uh, the public to discover the 700 year history of Singapore. That's way before the rifles time as well, which is, very, uh, which is uh, you know, have a wealth of like uh, history, historical kind of information to discover and learn about. And the, this project interesting in the sense that um, it, we, we have a two kind of like a, a so-called, uh, I won't say restrictions, but requirement. One is that as you have known, um, you know, we have the SG50 campaign trying in the 2015, then followed by we have the, you know, the SG mark that kind of involved. So one of the requirement is that how for the SG bicentennial campaign, um, how do we kind of like evolve uh, using, kind of have a, have a mark that evolve from what has been done in the SG50 and the SG mark. And second thing is that how do we tell uh, the stories or the narrative of the 700 year histories that these SG bicentennial are trying to commemorate. 
So it was an interesting challenge in the sense that if you think about the scope involved and how do we kind of like, um, you know, kind of encapsulate everything in a in a simple visuals in the in the in the in the in the in the short visual form. So um, you know, as we kind of like explore and play around, the whole idea came to us is that um, you know, as uh, Singapore is known as the little red dot. So we asked the question. So basically, if you're looking back, so what is little red dot before it is a little red dot? And we kind of play with the whole visual form. The visual form of it is that if you look at the circles, um, what is circles before it is a circle? So it, it, if you kind of like play with mathematics and even uh, a bit of uh, like, you know, uh, drawings and stuff like that, you will know that, you know, if you take a square, and you add enough sides to it, it becomes a hexagon and it becomes an octagon. And eventually it forms enough sides that it approximates into enough line segments that it almost looks like a circle when you look far enough. So it kind of gives us an idea. It's almost like a diamond in the rough kind of a process. So we can we sort of like um, you know, conceptualize the seven uh, poly shapes that shows the progressions of how the circle came about, how the little red dot came about. And of course, along the way, you know, each, uh, each of the progressions is also has a, a story and narrative to it. As you know, in the beginning, it's just a simple octagon, you know, following the coins. Um, then, you know, as we develop as a society, economically, uh, culturally, we have more events, we have more progressions, we have more advances and, you know, just kind of like represented by the sites, then eventually it comes to what uh, we known as the modern modern society of Singapore. So from there, we just kind of like group it together and you have the SG Bicentennial, the visual identity. So if you kind of put it together, it's sort of like a, a sequel of the prequel. So it still has that heritage, but it able to stand it alone by itself and able to kind of like um, express the narrative of what SG Bicentennial is. So from there, we you know, developed the whole visual language for the brand. So this is like the logo lockup uh, as uh, for, the, for the campaign. And then we start to develop like the visual language of it, how the logo uh, will be used in different kind of a visual uh, scenarios and contexts, and then um, this is just some quick example to show us like uh, we developed the stationary sets for the Prime Minister office uh, team for this, uh, Gene and the amazing team that we work with, the, the folder, and then how we use the poly shapes elements uh, to indicate the timeline, the tag, the top bag, um, you know, the $20, the commemorative you know, with the SG Bicentennial logo in it, and then um, the, yeah, the, you know, the, the main thing of it is the brand identity guide, which we develop so that all the other uh, vendors, uh, you know, who kind of, you know, uh, work on events and, and all kinds of activities uh, under the SG Bicentennial, they are able to take this uh, identity guidelines and then, uh, you know, develop their own uh, activities and usage. So here we're trying to kind of like, develop a comprehensive visual language guidelines on how to use the logo itself, uh, the logo mark and the poly shapes. Uh, the colors for the logo and the typography. So sometimes we also like to work with uh, long-standing brands uh, because brands that is, uh, you know, been around uh, have a lot of heritage and history, which we find is a rich source of uh, inspirations and materials when we work on projects with, with them. So Levy and Brothers is one of those uh, brands that we uh, consider ourselves fortunate to work with. Uh, actually, they have been around. For those who are not aware of uh, Lillian Brothers, uh, they are famous for their uh, traditional ota, nasi lemak, and, and you know, the, all the anchovies and peanuts. And you can see uh, their, 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 their food chaos in all the major malls and, and different places. So um, they actually came to us to engage us that they, they actually kind of forward thinking in the sense that um, they're trying to take the traditional ota 
as we all know and love, um, I, I think most people love Ota, um, came to uh, this Ota and they trying to kind of push it in a new direction in the sense that they trying to kind of like uh, create, uh, use Ota as a base ingredient to, to, to kind of express it in a more modern cuisine techniques. So think of like Ota burger, Ota fries, uh, Ota Reuben rolls, etc. So because uh, Livy and Brothers are known to be like, you know, the classic Ota, so they try not to dilute the brand, but create a new uh, sub brands out of it. And then to kind of like take a new take, uh, sort of take a new take on the Ota itself. So they came to us, you know, we collaborate, we're trying to kind of like help them to define the creative directions, how we can go about it. So um, luckily they decided to name the, the new uh, brand called, just called Ota. And it's sort of like, basically um, the problem is just solve it by itself. So for Ota, we basically take what we love about Ota and we translate into a simple modern form. So basically Ota, as you, as you see in the long shape form, you know that it, it kind of like reminds you visually immediately like um, what Ota is. And, and from there, we kind of like in a very simple way, you know, Ota, you see those traditional Ota, they usually grill, they have a lot of, um, you know, Ota in the, in the grill sets. So we're trying to create that sort of like a visual memory and create a more graphic visual language motif out of it. And from there, um, we also help them coin the, the slogan, Fresh Take on the Classics. And we use this bright, um, very spicy kind of like neon, uh, orangey colors against the, the, the banana leaves, the, the green, to kind of like uh, create a very, how to say, uh, a classic, but also kind of like a bit of a contemporary flavor, sort of color palette to the visual. And then um, this is just a quick look of the whole packaging set. Um, so from there, we have like the nasi lemak with uh, different flavors of ota. And then this is the, packaging sets, so we have like, um, so we're trying to take the, this simple Ota kind of like a visual identity. We created a motif as a base of the visual language, and then we use it on all the packagings and you know, the paper bags and stuff like that. But we also try not to just, um, you know, plaster it all over, but we wanted to kind of like make sure that wherever it is applied, it's applied with a purpose, with, uh, with some thoughts like, why are we applying it and how does it relevance to the packaging itself? So here we have like a nine, uh, nine little kind of like a circles is to indicate the nine different uh, content that the ingredients that is in the nasi lemak pack itself. And then this also translates to the burger. So this is like the, the Ota burger, which is very good. And then, um, yeah, we have the, oh, the, the burger shapes on it. And then these are the paper wrap and then and the paper bag itself. So we also uh, help them kind of like design this custom uh, Ota packaging. So when people order the Ota, like the scallop Ota, like the salmon Ota, which is uh, completely new. And all this pack um, is, uh, you know, designs for takeaway. And we use the motif, as you can see, there's a cut hole. So because Ota, they kind of like, you know, uh, they, they kind of like uh, serve it hot. So there's a lot of steam. So some of the things that we're trying to solve is to have make sure that there's a venting hole for the packaging. And then, you know, have the usual, the ikan bilis and the ikan bilis peanuts and the sambal chili following the same visual language for the brands in the new packaging. So apparently, um, the ikan bilis and the ikan bilis peanut in these colors are very popular with all the aunties. Uh, they've been selling very well for Livy and uh, for Ota and Livy and Brothers. So Livy and Brothers are actually using the packaging itself in, in Livy and Brothers. Yeah, so uh, you can actually find it in all the all their food chaos. Uh, yeah. So this is just some uh, closer look on the packaging and how we apply the motif. And this is the ikan bilis, peanuts, and the, and the anchovies packaging. Yeah. So um, I'm often trying to find opportunities to actually have, um, 
you know, um, work with Chinese typography in the project as well. And this one actually came at the right time uh, when Edwin from Super Mama uh, came and gave us like, uh, you know, would you like to you know, collaborate with them to design a, a visual identity for their new label, Nanyang Porcelain? And, you know, how can we say no? So for Nanyang Porcelain is that um, I actually, once I get the brief is, you know, we really wanted to incorporate Chinese typography in it for Nanyang, you know, it's like Southern China, you know, Southeast Asia, but then we all have our roots from the Chinese immigrants, you know, from China and stuff like that. So porcelain arts, you know, it's in the Nanyang region is known for all these bowls, buses with intricate arts and stuff like that. So we kind of take that inspiration and we're trying to kind of incorporate into the more like we're trying to kind of like using all these uh, porcelain object as a form, as the basis. And then we're trying to create a bespoke uh, Chinese typefaces for the word Nanyang. So as you can see here is the bowl and the vase for the yang. So we created this uh, Nanyang porcelain. So when we kind of, if you wonder why, we also kind of like, you know, um, kind of like, um, like have these uh, irregular uh, steps to the Nanyang porcelain. It's also kind of feel like trying to break that very typical logo kind of lines to it. Yeah, so end up it actually turns out well. And yeah, the result is, 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 is what we're quite proud of, yeah. And the last one is uh, I, I just kind of very quick. I think it's uh, uh, sort of like running out of time. Uh, Mount Green and Kane. And for this project, I would like to just say that this particular project is actually we go against the green in the sense that we try not to look at the past in order to design the <laughs> in order to design a visual language for it. So Mount Green and Kane is actually a new independent uh, bottler in Singapore. So what bottler does is that they kind of uh, sample all the you know whiskey rum and bourbon around the world and they find the right kind of like uh you know the, the right kind of taste to to what they kind of like uh, they them as a connoisseur and then they kind of buy it in and then they bottle it under the label so for margaret and Kate, you know for whiskeys and you know bourbons the usual brand is that you know if they look at them it's like quite kind of like uh almost sealed kind of like uh, graphic seals kind of, kind of like have a intricate kind of crest uh, kind of a branding visual so that you know it confers some sort of like a prestige heritage qualities and stuff but for Mark Gray and Keynes we decided to not do that so what we do is that we basically take the name, which is very nice by our client markers, is that Mount Green and Chain, basically the basic ingredients for whiskey, bourbon, and rum. And we're trying to create a, a modern graphic interpretation of it. So you can see the, the, you know, the mount, which is the mount and the, the, the green is the, the sort of like shapes. And then the cream, uh, the cream, which is the sugar cane, sorry. So from there, we just create a simple modern looking uh, identity. And from here, we developed the whole visual language for it. We wanted it to kind of like, um, you know, simple, simple yet sophisticated, and also kind of like confer a certain quality. So this is uh, the packaging that we designed for Mountain King uh, year one's uh, first bottle. Yeah, and then a uh, very quick run through. So we, we actually work with uh, our clients uh, quite a long time to, on all the print treatments and stuff like that. To, to kind of like get it right. And then from there, the visual language that we developed, we you know, put it in the wrapping paper, uh, name cards, and then uh, this is a uh, year one bottle two, and then the carton boxes, and you know, even the, the uh, ceiling tape, and then uh, the visuals, the tote bag, and then, uh, yeah the digital catalog that we developed for them for the year one bottles, the foundation years, and then um, an entire visual language we're trying to kind of like capture it and develop it as a ranking guidelines for our client as well. Yeah, you can see here the color palettes and then the typography. Yeah, so basically, um, yeah. Um, thanks for your time, um, yeah. Um, as Felicia um, mentioned earlier, we're a multidisciplinary practice. Um, we work in 
different scales and different kind of across different disciplines um, from architecture to interiors to product design to furniture. And the projects I'm showing today are kind of, um, they're kind of ideal projects for us because they're emblematic of what we hope to do. Um, and um, in a sense that they involve all different kind of the, the different kind of um, skill sets in the office. And the, we would draw on all the different kind of backgrounds and different kind of training that the people in the office have had. Um, they are, <clears throat> both of them, for the Virgin group of um, companies. Um, Virgin Atlantic, um, as you know, is start, was started by Richard Branson. Um, it's an airline company based in the UK. Um, in 2008, we were at that point, um, <clears throat> our sort of portfolio at the, up to that point in time was basically um, sort of uh, private residential architecture and interiors. And we wanted to vary um, our diet of work a little bit. So we sent out portfolios to a few commercial companies. Uh, one of them was Virgin Atlantic. And um, to our surprise, they called us back. Um, and we thought that initially that they would ask us to do one of their airport lounges because that seems like the most kind of um, closest in terms of our experience and relevance. Um, but to our surprise, they called us to um, look at, um, they, they gave us a test brief basically to look at the future of flight. So and with the aim of <clears throat> eventually working on the sort of the, the, the aircraft cabin. Um, so that was tremendously exciting. And so we set about sort of, I mean, I think the thing about uh, Virgin, the Virgin group of companies, they're very kind of heavy on process and research, what they call the discovery phase. And we set about sort of um, uh, trying to research what was the future of flight, what was the future of luxury, and bear in mind this is in 2008, so you know a lot of these things I'm talking about now are now commonplace, and you know we, we take for granted. But at the time, these things were these ideas were just coming into being. Um, <clears throat> so we um, realized that, or we discovered that the idea of the old idea of luxuries were being replaced by new ideas of, you know, sort of the old uh, ideas of material luxury were being replaced by um, the ideas of kind of um, unique experiences um, of knowledge, um, of intellectual challenge. And we kind of thought about how we might incorporate it, incorporate these into the Virgin um, aircraft cabin. <clears throat> um, we were also asked to look at so visual references, and we looked at the work of Erwin Hauer, which we like a lot, Anthony Gaudi, um, Pierre Paulin, um, Noguchi, uh, Palazuelo, and also you know natural phenomenon like the Northern Lights. And what we realized with these images that we've been looking at is <clears throat> they're all kind of interpretations of natural phenomenon, um, and and they they are to do with light, most of them. Um, so the, the thing, the way um, the Virgin team works is they have an in-house design team, which are kind of helmed by uh, trained um, industrial and product designers, and they would manage us as the external agencies in, in working on these, uh, these projects. So they encourage us to play, and it was a really kind of great experience because, you know, it was kind of, um, it was meeting of sort of like minds in, in a way. And um, <clears throat> they encourage us to play and explore these kind of different kind of ideas um, of how to bring light into the cabin, um, of how to kind of, um, you know, both artificial light as well as natural light. Uh, we went through many iterations during this test brief, um, so which are seen on screen. And um, <clears throat> but the, the other thing about uh, Virgin is they are very heavy on um, the um, customer experience. So they encourage us not to design um, the hardware of the cabin interior, but also the, the, the more the software, the passenger experience, how we curate that experience. So we set about kind of discovering how the light conditions change, the sight line changes during the time of a flight, um, how the activity changes, um, both in terms of you know um, convivial activities and, and more cocoon-like activities, how the interactions between um, crew and passenger would take place at <clears throat> different times of the flight. Um, so we did a series of diagrams, and um, and then we came up, and then also the um, the the main kind of focal point of the cabin interior for us in terms of the brief was to um, uh, was was their bar. So the thing about Virgin Atlantic planes is that they have a bar for the business class passengers. Um, <clears throat> so this bar is, um, they, they already have a bar sort of, you know, in the previous situations of the aircraft. So we were asked to come up with a new iteration. 
Um, so <clears throat> the, the, the one that came before us was the traditional kind of U-shaped bar where the barman would stand or the, the crew member would stand behind the U-shape and then there would be five or six sort of bar stools where passengers would sit around. Um, so we wanted to sort of up end that, we wanted to challenge that and we wanted to kind of come up with a bar that was more kind of interactive, that was a little bit looser in terms of back of house, front of house relationship. Um, and then also it would sort of, um, you know, sort of um, allow people to use the bar in different ways. So you could sit at the bar or you could perch or you could sort of walk around or, or stand around. <clears throat> These are some very early um, sort of concepts. So finally, you know, after going, having kind of passed that test brief, we were given the actual um, commission to, to work on the bar. Um, so this is the plan of the, um, the final product. So um, you come in through these doors and then the bar is arranged at a diagonal um, so that it appears longer or there is also the possibility of fitting in more space. Um, you can sort of sit at the bar stool. Um, that's where the crew member would be behind, but you can walk around him. So you can, it's not <clears throat> completely in around you. It's not 360 degrees, but it's at least 270. Um, you can also perch at these kind of areas here, or you could, you know, stand around here. And then these two little triangles are sort of what we call monuments, which are, which contain storage for, um, you know, um, uh, spirits as well as magazines. Um, <clears throat> so it's very much a, a piece of mini architecture because it is a cabin within the cabin. Um, it's kind of this wraparound structure, um, you know, which forms, which kind of peels round to form the bar surface. Um, and then, you know, this is just kind of a quick video to show you the different kind of iterations that we went through. Um, and it was a very long process. It, it took about three or four years. So um, it starts with um, sort of these computer models of <clears throat> how, you know, we would sort of accommodate the, um, the, 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 the storage as well as light within these kind of the peels of, of this um, skin. Um, and then where there's a peel, the, the texture might change or, or there, were, there might be light inserted in, in where, there's a, where, the, where there's a break in the surface as well. Um, and then, you know, we also sort of went from, um, you know, sort of these computer models to physical models. So, um, you know, it started out as kind of half scale um, card models in our office. <clears throat> and then it went to the kind of the aircraft hangar um, where we would install kind of full scale models. Um, the, um, the images will come up in a sec um, of the models. So these are the early polystyrene models. <clears throat> and then we went on to sort of um, put in sort of more realistic materials um, and the actual materials finally. And the, actual, the, the final product. Um, Um, so some final images of the of the bar itself. So these are the three kind of bar stools on the on the left hand side, um, and then you see the peel of the um, the bar structure kind of going overhead. And where there's a break, there's a light. <clears throat> where there's light, or there's kind of accommodation for you know glasses, etc. And because it is a, a plane, every single millimeter counted. So you know where there is um, accommodation given over to glasses, for instance, and then you, you take away some, I mean, you know, every, there isn't a spare kind of, um, you know, square centimeter or cubic centimeter in, in this structure. Um, uh, glasses uh, storage. Um, and that's the back of the bar where the, um, the crew member would stand. <clears throat> so as you can see, it's, it's kind of quite nicely finished. So there is no messiness or anything like that. So, you know, it is a presentable part of the um, experience as well. Um, these are the perches that I mentioned earlier, so you can perch, um, you know, um, and, and be part of that sort of convivial environment. A um, couple of years later, we had the opportunity of working with the Virgin Group again, and this time, as you know, um, Richard Branson, you know, he's one of the billionaires in this world who is in that space race. And um, <clears throat> he set up a company called Virgin Galactic um, with the idea of, you know, doing commercial flights into space. Um, and currently they're based out of Spaceport America, which is um, in the New Mexico desert. 
Um, it's a building designed by, by Norman Foster. Um, it's a circular building, <clears throat> but with a sort of little bit of an earthworks kind of tail. Um, so you enter through here, through this kind of um, Corten clad tunnel, um, and then you actually go down in, in level as well. Um, and then you, you come up in, 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 until you kind of finally enter this kind of circular building. And the, the building is split into three parts. <clears throat> so the, the first part would be the, um, the kind of admin and offices, the middle part, the hangar for the spacecraft. And then the final part will be the public area of the, um, of the building, which is the, it, it comprises the lounge, the offices, as well as the training center. And that's a fully glazed facade, which faces the uh, runway, which is this kind of um, straight piece of tarmac here. So our brief was to um, look at the lounge <clears throat> um, as well as the offices. We were asked to do the offices later. Um, <clears throat> the, um, so that's, that's the pie that is the segment of the, the circular, circular building. Um, you enter through this kind of um, <clears throat> walkway, which we call the Astro Walk. Um, so this is where you come into the space from, from, the, you know, from, from the rest of the building. Um, and it's also where the, um, the astronauts, I mean, the people who sort of pay to go on these flights are called astronauts. So the wet, this is where the astronauts would sort of um, go um, um, through to, to before they embark onto the uh, spacecraft beyond here. So, um, <clears throat> and then the lounge is to one side of, of this astral walk. Um, and it is a place where it has def uh, different functions. It is a place where um, the astronauts will come and sort of, you know, hang out and, and meet with the, interact with the, the pilots or the crew. Um, it's also where friends and family would, um, you know, sort of uh, rest when the flight is actually taking place. It's where the press would also gather. Um, and during non-flight days, because the flight doesn't take place every day, um, Non-flight days, the uh, the people who work in that building, they use it as their cantinas and, and their extended living room, basically. So there is a food kind of um, facility here. So there's a there is a pantry or servery which is connected to the main kitchen, and then the rest is kind of like a, a, a open plan space. Um, there is a um, <clears throat> galleried kind of um, office built uh, office floor above. But you know, the most of it is double height. On on this side of the the pie. <clears throat> is a sort of a multi-purpose space, um, which we, um, uh, it's, a, it's a phase two kind of scenario, but um, it hasn't really sort of taken place yet. Um, so as usual with the Virgin Group, I think they're very kind of um, into um, getting the concept right, that they're very into kind of, um, you know, the uh, designing the passenger experience. And we were working with a creative, not, not with a in-house design team, but with a creative director who was in charge of the overall um, uh, ideas of, uh, so the overall kind of visuals of the um, things like the, well, the lounge obviously, and then also the uniforms, the spacecraft. So he has an overview of the, um, the entire passenger journey. So, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so what was important was, you know, we had to identify very early on where our sort of lounge sat in that journey. So, um, you know, it's obviously the sort of the, the, the flexion point or the fulcrum, you know, as, as one transitions from earth to, to, to space. Um, and then, you know, and then also we were taking cues from the actual building because, you know, Norman Foster's building also had that sense of transition as you enter the sort of the building from this kind of court and clad tunnel into the actual building and then you emerge into this kind of very light, um, fully glazed space, um, finally. So, you know, we wanted our, um, our space to also have that sense of transition of that sense of um, uh, uh, progression <clears throat> in terms of um, opacities, in terms of texture, in terms of the light environment. Um, these are some of the sort of expansion of these images, of, the, of these ideas of the materials and textures and colors for, um, you know, I mean, I think what was important was <clears throat> for us not to replicate this kind of sense of being in space because, you know, there's no point trying to replicate it on Earth when you're about to sort of go into space itself. So we wanted to celebrate the idea that you are actually on Mother Earth. Um, and, you know, but mother, being on Mother Earth has kind of different kind of, you know, there's a, there's a temperature, there's a range of temperature of, of being very, very kind of, you know, dense and very warm to something much more ethereal and much lighter. 
but you know, it's still, you know, pretty, it's still very much off the earth. Um, and also because, you know, it had to, the space had to kind of um, uh, accommodate different people at different points in time and also, you know, different days and different types of people. Um, we were also wanted to, um, to kind of map out how this uh, servery and the served and serving spaces would work in that, in that area, in the open plan space. So we were mapping out, you know, how these would affect different kind of um, passenger or, or, you know, circulation flows. And then <clears throat> whether it's a, um, you know, sort of a focal point concept for the serv serving space, or it's a sort of more like a field where it's a little bit more scattered. Um, some early kind of um, studies into how seating might work, whether it's a sort of, whether it's convivial seating, whether it's more individual seating, or whether it has a focal point um, in the middle here. Um, we also did light studies <clears throat> in, because the, the, the sun in that part of uh, New Mexico is very, very strong, especially very early in the morning. So we just wanted to, um, you know, sort of make sure uh, there were no surprises in terms of, you know, glare and stuff like that. And also light studies in terms of um, the evening. Um, and then also like we, you know, uh, as I said before, you know, we were trying to sort of celebrate the fact that we are on Mother Earth. And so we were actually, we went on these kind of hikes in the, in the nearby kind of areas <clears throat> to look at the geology of, of the space around. And we wanted to kind of uh, let, uh, absorb those influences and, and also translate it into the furniture that we were designing. So for instance, in this case, the, the, the upholstery details. Um, and having sort of these kind of rough concepts, we mapped it out in the space itself. So this is the, um, the double height space I was talking about. Um, the, the gallery sort of office space is above, um, and that's the area where you come into, um, that's the astral wall that you come into. Um, so we mapped it out with, uh, we, we plotted it out with um, OSB boards and, and plastic office furniture, <clears throat> just to kind of test sight lines, to test kind of um, groupings, um, And whether the size of the um, the uh, the group the grouping, you know, whether, whether that's an optimum size for you know a table setting, or whether it's more kind of individual seating by the window. We also brought materials to site to test how you know light the very strong sunlight would <clears throat> react with it in terms of translucency, and then also in terms of filtering the very strong sunlight. <clears throat> So that's the plan of the space that we came up with finally. Um, so you enter the, um, the, the, the space through this astral walk um, on the right-hand side of the screen. And then there is this raised area which connects to the servery and the kitchen. Um, and then uh, around this kind of raised platform are two very large sofas, which are you know, the convivial parts of the, <clears throat> of the seating area. And they kind of surround this kind of barista, what we call the barista island, which is like the focal point. Um, which is where you pick up your drinks and juices and stuff like that. And <clears throat> this is also where you could sort of, you know, sort of uh, hang out and meet people. And then along the window are sort of more kind of um, sort of slightly more secluded seating because it is away from the sort of the main center of attract, uh, center of activity. Um, but they, they kind of um, accommodate different uh, groups of different sizes. So you have a slightly larger <clears throat> um, area here, which we call the Mesa, and then a slightly smaller one. And then these are more individual kind of window seats. Um, a section through um, showing the double height space that you have the first floor kind of um, <clears throat> office area. And then, you know, that, that sort of overlooks in the gal uh, from the gallery, this double height space onto the, the lounge below. Um, we wanted to, because the, the back wall is the, <clears throat> the only solid wall, um, it had to accommodate a lot of services, a lot of sound insulation, acoustic insulation, um, a lot of um, storage requirements. So in order to kind of um, organize all of that, we, we created this kind of wooden screen, which transitions from being very dense and very dark from, from ground and going up to being much lighter and much more, um, much less opaque. 
And then also it transitions to this kind of mesh um, ceiling um, <coughs> structures, which um, also help to filter the sun. A section through the, um, the, gal uh, the galleried kind of um, lounge as well as the office above. So these are some kind of site um, photos. Um, you see the Barista Island in the foreground, and then you have the sort of two large sofas on here and here. A uh, look, a view down the, um, the Astro Walk, and you have these kind of tilted mirrors above. I'll explain why in a, in a little while. Um, a Barista Island in, uh, in the middle of the space. Um, and then the, 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 the timber slats also become the balustrades at the top. Um, and this is, um, we, we lined the uh, Astro Walk with these kind of interactive or touch sensitive LED screens. Um, so the video content can be changed. And then, you know, during a flight, for example, when the astronauts walk down towards their flight, it could leave footprints in the sand, for instance, you know, blah, blah, blah. But during the flight itself, it could also be, um, they could also project, you know, the information on the flight, you know, in, in real time. So that friends and family can see it on that sort of reflected mirror. Some uh, views of the final space. And finally, um, a video showing how it is being used by the Virgin Galactic family. So these are some views of the office above that we designed as well. Um, thank you. Thank you, Voon. We will now be moving on to the Q&A segment of today's session. So if I could invite all speakers to join us back on screen, please. And to our audience, do continue posting your questions for our speakers through the Q&A function. So Kelly, handing the time back over to you. Thanks, Felicia. Uh, awesome presentation, Voon. That was really cool. Thank you. Uh, OK, we have, again, once again, many questions. So I'm going to start with Yi Chen, because your questions came in first earlier on. Uh, the first question is, hi, Yi Chen. Thanks for sharing with us. What inspire your very unique approaches to design? Uh, okay, thanks for the question. So I think I answer it um, in, in two ways. One is, um, you know, I, I always approach the project looking at what is the most essential um, that um, makes the project come into being. For example, with the... Thermal Miller project, I actually researched um, like more than 50 chairs and basically um, finally I found that the Eames was the one of the most iconic pieces of furniture they, they do carry um, from Herman Miller. And um, then I started look, looking at how uh, the motor plywood got introduced into the whole furniture design um, language and uh, they were kind of inspired by leg spleens that were used to support um, you know, broken fractured legs during Second World War, and they imported that technique uh, into um, furniture. So, so that became the kind of inspiration, for example, for for, for this project. And likewise, I look for um, maybe uh, like what would be the most essential or the kind of deep structure within a situation uh, when I approach uh, any any project. And most of the time, this gives me. Um, some some kind of inspiration. The second thing is, uh, it's more selfish. It's more like uh, I wanted to continue practicing and doing research at the same time. So there should be a continuity in my projects um, from project to project. So I ask, what are the you know questions that I would like answered in the next project uh, when it comes along? So um, I would then propose uh, solutions that would enrich or kind of further the ongoing research that my studio has. So I think 
um, yeah, I think most of the time it's balanced between the two because most of my research uh, come from paid projects. And, and, and that's how I think we can accumulate uh, knowledge as we go along in, in practice. Yeah. Thank you, Yichen. Uh, next question I will shoot to Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, how do you manage the sensitivity, uh, sensitivities when working on projects that hold a lot of cultural weight, heritage and meaning? And how do you balance that with creative ideas? Okay. Uh, thanks for the questions. Um, I think um, it just it is something that um, you know uh, uh, for every project that we actually kind of like uh, make sure that we do is that um, whatever creative ideas or even our approach to designs and um, whatever we're trying to do, trying to push the envelope and stuff, it should always in the service of our clients, uh, our project, our the sub in service to the subject, to, to our clients, to, to, to what we're trying to solve. So in a sense is that um, whatever we're trying to push and, and what we're trying to, to kind of do like out of the box or like trying to, you know, be creative and, you know, explore in the ways that has been done. But if it doesn't work for that project in the sense that it doesn't fulfill what we're trying to achieve for it, then I don't think it works. Uh. So it's always that kind of like benchmark or at least the skills is kind of like help us to kind of like bring in in terms of how we approach the project without going overboard. Yeah. And most of the time is our client is the best uh, litmus test. Uh. Like, you know, when we're trying some, you know, crazy kind of like uh, creative directions and our clients like, mm -hmm, I'm not too sure. Then we know that we are not, uh, we are not, striking in the right ways or we are just kind of speak in our own way without actually trying to solve the problem in the right way yeah hope that kind of answer your question okay thanks jonathan okay boon uh here's one for you uh the question goes hi boon where do you start when designing such futuristic projects like the spaceport or things that haven't been done before where do you get your reference points um, we start at the beginning. <laughs> um, I think, uh, for example, like the Spaceport um, project, we were helped by the, um, the Virgin Galactic team in the sense that they um, allowed us time to really do a lot of kind of research and to, to do a lot of kind of work up front in terms of concept work and i think that was very important so there was a we spent many many months kind of discussing with the creative director about the concept <coughs> excuse me of, of the um of, of you know, around the space before we actually put any sort of designs or put you know sort of make any lines on paper so i think you know sort of um trying to understand um the nature of space travel we were you know asked to watch you know various kind of films and documentaries about space travel um doing that sort of making those hikes in in a new mexico desert um, um understanding you know sort of um, going to site to understand you know how their crew might sort of use that space you know etc cetera, etc cetera. all these different strands would come of come into, um, I mean, it's, I, I don't think it's any different from designing any other project really. Um, it, it's just like the, um, the program is a little bit different from, you know, what we normally do. Okay, thank I hope you. that answers the question. Uh, Yichun, I have a question for you. So uh, because you are, um, you know, you're very experimental and do quite a lot of this uh, computational parametric architecture. Does form follow function apply in this sort of exploration? Mm, not, not really. I mean, I think form, in, in my mind, uh, follows a certain purpose rather than function. Pur purpose has a more encompassing definition. So it's not so, so much the utilitarian function that we are after, but um, purpose suggest a larger uh, narrative that can be used to um, look into context and sometimes they go beyond uh, the immediate context. Uh, in this case, the context that I may want to look at could be 
uh, the fourth industrial revolution, revolution for example. But I, 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 I do uh, then think that um, um, they are form, form in, a, in a way, uh, when I think of it from a purpose point of view, um, allows uh, me to better argue uh, for, for the existence of uh, you know, either a method or um, the, the actual outcome itself. Um, at the end of the day, I think most of the time the form is, I, where the physical form, the, the object is a result of the process. And um, I, I most of the time would argue for the existence of the process to take place before uh, you know, the final um, image that appears after that. Yeah, I, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe I, I pose the same question to Boon since you know it's a it's a very architectural question to always ask whether we should you know subscribe to form follows function. So Boon, how um how much of your work you know subscribe to this idea of form follows function, or do you think that um the, the existence of a more conceptual narrative is more important as a driver for your designs? Um. <clears throat> I guess I'm quite old school. <laughs> so <laughs> form follows function for me. Um, I mean, I know that, you know, lots of different approaches, but for us, I think um, form follows function. And then also, I think, you know, um, through working with the Virgin Group, I think um, what is kind of quite important is also the, the user experience. Um, so, you know, the um, designing the experience of the, the end user is, is also quite um, <clears throat> that's what, you know, we've learned from, you know, working with companies like that. Um, so it's the, the function in a way um, is kind of a little bit more articulated in a sense, because, you know, um, it is not so, you know, because it's a little bit more complex. Um, so I think, you know, that, that always is the sort of the determinant of the, the form for us. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jonathan, so I'm going to tweak this same question a little bit to you. So for graphic designers, um, usually we prescribe to form following content. Um, so I think for branding, usually we, we can have a story and all that to, to follow. But how about when it comes to things like designing, let's just say a brochure, a book, um, how do you, how do you, you know, prescribe that kind of a solution or, or you don't? Um. I would say the so far the kind of uh, how how we kind of like have our creative process is always um for every project even like designing just uh, a book or something we always want to make sure that there's a certain idea that we want to kind of have like whether the idea is like how we wanted um you know the book um to be flipped and then there's a this particular tactile experience that kind of like create a narrative to understand a bit more of the content, et cetera. So um, the form is always, I guess, in the service of idea. Yeah, we always have to want to, um, we always insist and emphasize internally that we always should have some form of ideas or at least um, actually, uh, like you can say, a, a purpose, like why are we doing this? And then um, the form, which is a craft, the graphic design, the visual language is all to express this idea. Yeah. So I'm not sure like, is it like form follow functions, but more like I would say form follow the ideas of what we are trying to do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Here's a question for all three of you uh, from Yuan, uh, this person called Yuan Lam. Hello all. Thank you so much uh, to the speakers. I guess this is a more generic question to everyone. In today's world, where the dissemination of information and data for public use is of increasing importance to national health and security, how can design teams create works that reach across generations to communicate increasingly more complex issues and data sets? Not very hard to answer. <laughs> Uh, shall we start with uh, maybe Boon since you are the more experienced of the three? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to process the question. I think in short, this, it, it's about how designer can improve, um, you know, maybe like systems of health and security. 
but I think you know things like <clears throat> that all these kind of um I think a lot of these requirements are kind of embedded or institutionalized already because you know like for example in the UK there's we have very stringent health and safety kind of um uh, regulations to conform to, which is part of the sort of, um, you know, this, the, the approval process. Um, so, so that is already a kind of, you know, it's already kind of embedded in the requirements of the project. And of course, there are other requirements like, you know, sustainability, et cetera, et cetera, which again, you know, are becoming more and more kind of embedded into the requirements of the project. So, um, I mean, <coughs> excuse me, obviously you can go sort of beyond a sort of basic minimum to, to achieve, you know, sort of even higher targets of, you know, health and sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, I, I would say from, from our point of view, it's already, you know, it's already sort of part of what we have to do. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Yichen and Jonathan, what's your take on this? Yeah, I, I think, um, I think following what Boon said, I, I feel like, for example, things like sustainability, um, the, the data is not very well um, understood by a lot of people. So one thing is, I think for designers, maybe it is about um, making one uh, people, general public aware of sustainability targets. For example, like we don't know like how much energy is being used now in Zoom. Like we are having this Zoom here. But that's not that we can't read this, right? So a lot of this data are uh, not out. Uh, that, that, that there's no way of understanding this. And I feel like we are at the stage where we can actually make this awareness very uh, heightened. Uh, it becomes second nature for us to know some of this data that is important for us. Um, so, and then this data can be used for many different things. For example, uh, um, people can, uh, it's not, it's, it's data, you know, once they become streamlined and, and be classified into different categories, then, you know, we can use this information for research and to better certain systems and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, that, that is then bringing this data into context. Otherwise, it would just be noise. Like, for example, we are still not clear how we count carbon emission, for example, there's so much data out there. Yeah. And a lot of it oh, is, the text is, on all, is increasing though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so I think it, streamlining it uh, and then making it digestible and making it uh, part of the awareness <coughs> is, 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 is the immediate uh, step forward. Huh? Okay. I don't know. Yeah. Jonathan, do you want to add on to this? Um, if I understand the question correctly, like how design team create work across generations to communicate increasingly more complex issues and data set, I think it's like uh, if uh, uh, if I can just think of it as like how uh, how can we create kind of timeless designs that communicate uh, you know across generations on increasingly complex issues and data set. I think um um. The way I see is that also the way uh, I myself as a designer trying to kind of like practice is uh, principles and honesty. So as long as um, I feel like if I approach every project with uh, a certain principles and honesty and, and, and without being kind of like influenced by a lot of uh, more kind of like uh, temporary kind of like um, kind of influences and stuff like that, I think at least the work can stood the test of time. And also in terms of how uh, I approach a project with honesty on how I understand, interpret, and and kind of like solve it. Um, I think I done my part, and also in hope that it timeless enough that it actually can reach beyond the the time frame of the project. Yeah, it, it's just how we look at look back at all these uh, classic work, like you know from you know uh, architecture, furniture, graphic design, visual designs, art you know, all these work that, you know, I think all the, all the designers and artists itself, I think they approach it with a certain honesty, whether to themselves or to the subject they are working on. And that's how it transcends the so-called the generations, so to speak. Yeah. Well said. Okay, so uh, since you're here, Jonathan, uh, here's a question for you. Hi, Jonathan, were you inspired by 
M, uh, Mi logo, MI, Mi logo, redesign for the seven evolution of circus concept. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, the SG by Centennial uh, campaign actually runs in 2019. So we did it end of 2018. So we actually did it way before we introduced a new logo. La. So few. So yeah, we are we we definitely we did it before uh, this me new logo introductions and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. If that answers the question. <laughs> okay. Uh Yichen, there's another question for you. Uh, it goes, hi Yichen, thank you for show showcasing that amazing paneling idea. How does the maintenance work? Is it costly? Do you dismantle the structure should one of the pieces fall apart or becomes faulty? Yeah, so... Like Singaporean uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> maintenance is always the top question. Yeah. But um, um, the, so the systems are... I mean, we can assemble it, therefore we can take it apart. So everything is designed as kit of parts. And if it's, uh, for example, the, the, the music theater, um, the, the hexa hexagonal uh, uh, vault. Uh, you can take pieces down easily um, without compromising the structural integrity of the overall vault because the, the forces continue down um, from other panels. So uh, if there's any one that is, for example, the speaker that is hidden within this panel is broken, it can be easily rectified. So I think in terms of repair, it's not that much a uh, problem. Although right now uh, we are trying to train a team um, to do this installation and repair. So it's not just always coming back to us. Uh, maintenance, you know, like people who own fancy cars, they spend a lot on maintenance. Yeah. So I think this question Same should, idea. <laughs> should be put back to the client, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you buy a fancy car, you, you spend a lot on, on waxing it, changing the parts. Yeah. Um, Although, of course, I, I tried to uh, design some of these issues out initially, but I think that should be, uh, you know, give and take. Uh, if if, if uh, clients are asking for something that is more unusual, therefore, then we have to think of how to maybe clean it. Um, so, for example, uh, previously, I designed Wild Rocket for Willin Low as a restaurant, and it's made of, like, I don't know, like, uh, thousands of, of, of batons. So um, he actually did up a roster to, so that his staff would um, you know, uh, regularly uh, dust the, the lettuce. So I think it's a collaboration between us and the, the client. Sure. Definitely to, to bring, this, bring these things to, to life. Yeah. Absolutely. Fully agree with you on that. Yeah. Uh, okay, here's a question for Boon. Dear Voon, thank you for sharing with us. Any difference to how you approach projects for different countries? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think. <laughs> you always. I, mean, I don't. I don't have <laughs> geographical. Um, I don't have different geographical approaches. Um, I think it's just dependent on the client and the brief. I mean, we would. <clears throat> we would sort of slightly tweak our approach. I mean, obviously our central approach is, you know, because it is always us who's, who's doing the design, um, it's, it's more or less the same, but, you know, obviously, you know, within that, there is a sort of bandwidth of different, um, you know, ways you can sort of tweak your approach to suit the brief, to suit the client, to suit the situation. But um, I don't think that's geographically driven. Mm. Okay. Um, how about uh, clients? Uh, clients' expectation different across different geographies? in the UK, you know, it's very, you know, um, historical buildings are treated with much more, um, you know, sort of, you know, kid gloves. Um, whereas in Singapore, it's, you know, the, the sort of um, tear down and rebuild kind of scenario is much more prevalent. Um, so it's a slightly different approach to history um, or, or historical um, buildings. Um, but I, um, as, I, as I discussed with you earlier, uh, the other time, um, I think the, the differences kind of across the sort of geographical regions are sort of getting smaller and smaller. Um, you know, people are much more kind of have a slightly more international mindset. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, Jonathan, here's another question for you. It goes, hello, Mr. Yuan. 
I know you've worked with many brands that have traditional roots. As a designer who works with Chinese typography and traditional aesthetics, which you can have a lot of detail, how do you reconcile that with the modern image a lot of brands portray now? Do you ever feel it detracts from the traditional aesthetics? Sincerely, a big fan. Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, th thanks for the questions. Um, I think um, one of the things that we always do if when it comes to like, if let's say we are working with a, a, a long-standing brands and then um, a, a certain projects that require us to kind of like um, express a certain part of it in a more kind of like a modern, modern context, I guess the word is the context. So we're trying to kind of like put context into what we are trying to do and then how to and how to reconcile it based on context. So, for example, sometimes like a uh, like for example the Ota project. Um, for for us is that you know Ota is is kind of like it, it's a traditional food. And then um you know when we look around like all kinds of like a branding and graphic design that's been done for Ota, and then we look at it and then we see like does it feels like it's something that if we kind of put it out now that it will be relevant or at least it kind of like able to kind of like speak to a younger generations from now to five, 10 years on. So how do we kind of like, um, you know, approach it in such that we doesn't lo lose the heritage, but then we are still able to kind of like move it forward. So these are the kind of context that we kind of put it in and then trying to solve it. Yeah, in the sense that, yeah, <laughs> if that makes sense to the questions yeah <laughs> I hope the, the person who asked is happy with that there's another question yeah. for you uh okay. so i think this person was referring to your ota packaging packaging mm. it says mm. the packaging looks compelling do you consider materials sources waste and reduction of material use in your design process okay um I will honestly answer this question is that uh, no, because the entire packaging manufacturing uh, kind of like process was handled by the client. So our client actually has their own uh, manufacturing partners and stuff like that uh, kind of like handles all the, in terms of the type of paper use and how it be manufactured and stuff. So we just kind of came in to work with them in terms of the design. But I can understand the question in terms of like doing packaging design to be, uh, you know, we, we have to kind of consider the ways and, 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 you know, the kind of paper that we use, like, is it the type that, you know, SFEs or like, you know, certifications and stuff like that. So um, ultimately it really depends per project. Like some, most of the time, the kind of packaging uh, work that we, we work on, um, usually we work closely with clients and there is a certain restrictions in terms of uh, budgets and stuff like that. So we try our best to be, you know, as 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 green or like, you know, as as sounds good as possible. But ultimately, it still depends on a lot of factors to kind of like make it make it work, lah. Yeah, if that's kind of answer the question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Here's a question for all three uh, panelists. Uh, the question goes: How do the panelists address diversity? in one, work, and second, in teams. So again, maybe uh, we start with Boon. Um, <clears throat> how do I address diversity? I, I guess you mean in terms of um, ethnic background, you know, gender, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I guess we just kind of, um, in, in our team, you know, we, we try to be as, I mean, I don't know. It's almost like a, when we hire people, it's almost kind of like a, you know we don't really. Okay, let's let's just say that. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think there are some companies that uh, hire. They have a certain quota of say you know some someone from an ethnic minority. They have to hire blah blah blah. You know, um, we don't really take that approach. I mean, I think we just kind of we almost kind of have a blindfold kind of over our eyes when we hire someone because we just look at a portfolio and if that person is suitable. We hire that person. I think you know, um, you know whether. I mean, I I'm the kind of ethnic minority in my team, so <laughs> I, I take that box. Um, so um, 
so yeah, so we, we don't really sort of have a policy in that sense. Um, in terms of our work, I'm not sure how we address diversity because, you know, it's dependent on the project that we get. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know how to answer that question. Yeah, yeah. okay. I, I'll spare Jonathan this question because you work only with your wife. Correct, correct. Since you have a big team. Yeah. Um, yeah, I actually agree with Wood. I, I, I don't consider um, each gender, you know, um, that kind of thing. So I, I don't even look at grades. So I just look at the work. Yeah. And diversity in work um, comes with. Um, I, I think I'm just focused on every project that I get. So I hope for diversity. That means I, you know, I want to do a 40 story tower next time. <laughs> so, but you know, some things you can only wish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay so uh, I think we're coming to the, the final question because uh, it's already 645. Uh, so last question uh, from Grace Tan for all of you. What would you recommend a beginner designer to do to gain traction in design? Uh, Boon first. <clears throat> I think the clue is in the name because we all have design practices. So I think it involves practice. Just, you know, just got to keep doing it, you know, until you get better and, and get kind of, you know, you gain experience. Okay. Uh, Jonathan? Um, at least for graphic designs, I think the uh, most important thing is stay true to yourself and then just work hard, harder than anyone. And then like when say, you know, you just have to keep work, keep doing so that you, you know, you keep kind of like um, mature in a sense, the more you do, the more you have experience, the more you mature. And then it kind of like maturity kind of haunts your sensitivity, haunts the way you think. Hans, uh, like how you kind of like have more experience in uh, certain like you know handlings all kinds of like uh, situation and and also kind of like makes you generate a better designers so I think that is the only ways to kind of like get better as a begin as a beginner you know yeah so but among all these don't just kind of like work hard without a plan or without uh you know thinking lah. So, which is why um, as a designer, I think stay true to yourself is also one of the most important things. You have to have your own voice rather than being just a, you know, mindless armies that just chunk out work. You have to find your own voice and how, and kind of do a lot more to find your own ways in solving things. That is, I feel that is what makes a designer interesting. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's really uh, well said. Uh, Yichen, you want to uh, share your yeah, thoughts? Uh, yeah, um, actually, uh, I think when you just started out, uh, it's actually the best time to reject projects that you do not feel like you have a say. Because actually, when I have a big team now, sometimes it's really difficult to reject certain projects. Um, so on the contrary, when you are small, you're nimble, you, you should learn to reject those projects that where you, you feel you cannot contribute, uh, you cannot intervene meaningfully because once you start to compromise, that determines the next project that you're going to get. The profile starts to change and it's very hard to break out of that mold. So I would encourage people to <laughs> reject when they can, still can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, to, to, before I hand over to Felicia, uh, we have a very kind and generous compliment from one of the, the audience today. So I'm just going to share it quickly. Uh, she or he said, this whole session just begs the question, when are the three of you going to work on a project together? Seems like a match made in heaven. <laughs> so thank you guys. Okay, so with that, uh, I'm going to uh, hand over back to Felicia to close the session. Thank you guys so much for this very inspiring session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Felicia, back to you.
Thank you, Kelly, Yi Cheng, Jonathan and Woon for taking the time to join us today and for sharing your insights with us. It has been an absolute pleasure to hear from all of you. So more in-depth interviews with our speakers can also be found on Studio SML's website, along with podcasts on Studio SML's Spotify channel. So if you're keen, do scan the relevant QR codes that you see on your screen. The links are also currently being provided to you in our Zoom chat. And if you'd like to find out more about the other programs at the National Design Center, do scan the QR code that you see on the right. This is where I will now leave you. So thank you once again for joining us today. And we definitely hope to see you at our future events. Take care and goodbye. <laughs>